Pneumocystis urovechi causes pneumocystis pneumonia in immunocompromised patients. So basically, patients who have a weak immune system. These patients include people who have HIV or those on long-term immunosuppressants, such as prednisone. Pneumocystis urovechi can cause mild to very severe life-threatening respiratory infections. Pneumocystis is actually a fungus that was first found to infect humans back in World War II, in infants and children specifically who were malnourished and unwell. At the time, pneumocystis was thought to be a protozoan species because it had many forms that made it look like it was a protozoan under a microscope. However, genomic sequences found that pneumocystis is much more closely related to a fungus, and so it was reclassified as a fungus and not a protozoan. Pneumocystis urovici is an interesting organism. It loves the lungs. They stay and live in the alveoli, and for the most part do not cause any problems in people with a normal immune system. There are three developmental stages of pneumocystis. The trophic form, the sporocyte, and the spores. These stages all exist within the alveoli. The trophic forms can replicate through binary fission into two near identical trophic forms. And this is called asexual reproduction. Alternatively, the trophic forms can undergo sexual reproduction, and here the trophic forms they mate, divide, and form many spores inside a closed wall. This structure is called a sporocyte. A sporocyte is a cell that contains many spores. The sporocyte will eventually rupture and release all the spores it contains. Now these spores will then eventually become the trophic form of the organism once again. The trophic form of pneumocystis can then enter either the asexual or sexual reproductive cycle again. Unlike most fungi, pneumocystis lacks ergosterol in its cell wall. Therefore, commonly used antifungal medications that actually target ergosterol synthesis, such as the azoles and the amphotericin B, they do not work against pneumocystis. The cell wall of pneumocystis contains beta-D-glucan, which is important because beta-D-glucan is a blood test that can be ordered. Pneumocystis uh, organisms carry a variety of surface glycoproteins, these proteins on, on its surface, which uh, are actually unique to different pneumocystis species. So, for example, you know, there are many pneumocystis species, and each of these species actually infects only specific mammals. So, for humans, it's pneumocystis urovechi, which infects only humans. And then you have pneumocystis carinae, which only infects rats. And then pneumocystis marina, which only infects mice. Back in the day, pneumocystis carinae was thought to be the one that infected humans, but that's not the case. And so PCP is actually an abbrevi abbreviation for pneumocystis pneumonia and not pneumocystis carinae pneumonia. So let's talk about the pathophysiology of pneumocystis pneumonia. Well, pneumocystis is transmitted by uh, the airborne route. In healthy individuals, pneumocystis can colonize the lung and cause no problems. However, if a patient becomes immunocompromised, meaning they have a weak immune system, pneumocystis can lead to a terrible lung infection. Once in the alveoli and the patient's immune system is down, the trophic form of the fungus attaches to the alveolar type 1 cells and undergoes proliferation. Impaired humoral and T-cell mediated immunity contribute to this 
uncontrolled proliferation of the fungus and the host immune response results in a production of inflammatory substances, cytokines such as TNF-alpha and interleukin-1, which contribute to the lung damage. The principal histological finding in patients who have pneumocystis pneumonia is a foamy eosinophilic alveolar exudate. There may be highline membrane formation. There is also interstitial fibrosis and underlying edema as well. The risk factors for developing pneumocystis pneumonia is therefore anything that can cause someone to have a weak immune system. HIV was a common cause of pneumocystis pneumonia. In fact, the rate of pneumocystis infection dramatically rose with the HIV epidemic. And this is because people who had HIV back in the time, their immune cells were depleted. And thanks to the discovery of effective antiretroviral treatment, the rates of pneumocystis in patients who have HIV have dropped significantly. The most significant risk factors for uh, pneumocystis pneumonia in patients without HIV are really those who take steroids and those with a, a defect in their uh, cell-mediated immunity. Other risk factors include hematological malignancies, solid organ malignancies, organ transplantation, rheumatological diseases, autoimmune diseases, and the use of other immunosuppressive drugs. The classic presentation of someone with pneumocystis pneumonia, it can vary, but typically progressive dyspnea, dry cough, fever, which is often mild, weight loss, and diffuse bilateral interstitial infiltrates, ground glass changes, they call it, on the x-ray. Extra pulmonary manifestation of the fungus is rare because remember, these guys, they love the lungs. Investigations to order for anyone with suspected pneumocystis pneumonia is an ABG to evaluate severity of the hypoxemia. Lactate dehydrogenase, LDH, can be ordered. And this is actually a good clinical indicator of possible pneumocystis pneumonia, specifically in HIV patients. As mentioned, beta-D-glucan, which is the part of the uh, cell wall of the fungus. And so if you check it in the blood, and if you don't find it, then it is helpful to rule presence of this fungus out. Gold standard to diagnose pneumocystis pneumonia is actually identification of the fungus through respiratory secretions. And this is either from induced sputum specimens or from bronchoalveolar lavage. So uh, fluid from the actual bronchus itself. And once you obtain the respiratory specimens, there are many stains that can be used to help identify trophic forms or the cyst forms of the fungus. Finally, PCR can also be used to really pin down the organism. A CT chest is fundamental in, in suspected pneumonia cases. And CT classic findings include bilateral ground glass changes, such as in this image here. You can see ground glass hazy type changes in both lobes of the lung. Hyla or mediastinal lymphadenopathy is rare in pneumocystis pneumonia. Finally, treatment. Once the diagnosis of pneumocystis pneumonia is established through identification of the fungus through microscopy or PCR, trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole is used first line. This is typically known as Bactrim. There are alternative antimicrobials to use in those who cannot tolerate um, Bactrim, and this includes clindamycin and primaquin, dabsone or trimethoprim, and or atovaquone. Interestingly, steroids can be used as an adjunct for treatment in patients with severe pneumocystis pneumonia, as long as they don't have HIV. 
In patients with HIV, corticosteroids uh, as an adjunct or an addition for treatment of severe pneumocystis pneumonia is not recommended. Prevention of pneumocystis pneumonia is very important. And this is done also with trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole as well. Prophylaxis is given to those with a weak immune system, including if someone is having high dose steroids for a long duration. And this also includes other immunosuppressants. Prophylaxis is given to those with an immunodeficiency disorder, whether it's acquired or congenital. And also, prophylaxis is given to those uh, who already had the infection in the past. And so this is secondary prophylaxis to prevent recurrence. So in summary, pneumocystis pneumonia is caused by the organism pneumocystis urovecci in immunocompromised people, those with a weakened immune response. Classically, patients present with a worsening cough, dyspnea, and low-grade fevers. On x-ray, you have increased markings bilaterally, ground glass changes. Treatment is Bactrim, so trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole. Finally, prophylaxis is important in those with, uh, who are at risk as well. Thank you for watching.